morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters and friends, uh, everyone who has traveled from afar, those who come from uh, the local area, thank you very much for making it today. Um, on behalf of the Cordoba Foundation, I welcome you all to this, the launch of um, this report, the Henry Jackson Society and the Degeneration of British Neoconservatism, uh, Liberal Interventionism, Islamophobia and the War on Terror. Um, my name is Anas al Tiflisi. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Cordoba Foundation and its founder. And um, first and foremost, I must uh, declare an interest here. Um, the Cordoba Foundation um, has been one of the, uh, the main targets of uh, neoconservatives, um, right-wing politicians, ag agenda-driven media, um, as well as various other regimes from around the world who have abysmal records on human rights and uh, democracy and freedoms and the like. Um, and uh, we have, as many of you will know, um, suffered uh, on various levels, one of them um, uh, on the level of our bank accounts being closed. And, uh, but then I'm, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing people you know, such as Asim and others who have uh, met similar uh, fates, but uh, we continue to work hard, and this path is a path that we have decided that we will, we will walk, we will pursue, we will uh, persevere with. It's uh, it's something that we not only feel but know is right, and uh, the alternative is so much uh, problematic. I'd uh, I must uh, thank our friends from Spinwatch. Uh, I think that uh, Professor David Miller who will speak shortly, and his team, who will also address uh, this launch. Uh, they have been uh, an exemplary uh, partner of ours in trying to understand the depth to which these uh, ideas go and how far they reach, uh, the networks, the structures, uh, the money, the personnel, and the such. Um, and uh, our partnership with them will uh, continue, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, our first venture together was a, a couple of years ago, actually three years ago, uh, when uh, Spinwatch uh, were, were commissioned by ourselves to, uh, uh, to publish uh, the Cold War on British Muslims, um, exposing the policy exchange and Center for Social Cohesion. The Center for Social Cohesion, of course, which has now morphed into the Henry Jackson Society, which we're talking about today. So this is our second partnership with Spinwatch and uh, hopefully there will be more to come. This is an extremely timely event and we are particularly pleased that we, this launch is happening um, in the midst of the conference held at uh, Bath University, Understanding Conflict. Uh, this is the final day, I understand, and I, 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 I also hear extremely good things about what uh, you have all been part of uh, discussing over the past uh, three to four days. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be launching this report um, at this uh, particular event. Um, I have uh, to apologize beforehand for the fact that uh, unfortunately it seems that everything that happens needs to happen in London. And hence when we, uh, we invited people over the past few weeks to this launch, everyone was asking, well, why not in London? Well. Um, I have to say that traveling to Bath, the, the, the last time I was here was about 30 years ago. I traveled here uh, on a college uh, venture with some friends when, uh, when I was a, a wee lad at 17. And uh, I have to say I'm mesmerized by the beauty of this particular um, region and uh, the surroundings. And uh, I, I'm just flabbergasted why we don't do it more. Uh, I, you know, people who, uh, who pursue peace, maybe they ought to come more to, to, to Bath. Maybe that'll solve a lot of uh, the problems that we have in London. But anyway, um, we, we will be doing a launch in London and particularly in Parliament, as we did with the first installments with Spinwatch. Um, it will be after the summer recess, so do look out for uh, the launch uh, dates. The report is available now. You have it in hard copy. It's for those of you who haven't picked a copy uh, up already, it's outside. Uh, and it's also in PDF form on our website, and you're more than welcome to download it from there. Now, I basically what we're going to do for the next hour or so is to uh, hear from each of the authors, uh, and I will introduce them one by one, and then we will have 
our two uh, guest discussants, uh, Victoria Britton and Moazan Beg, who I will also uh, introduce um, uh, in due course. And then we will have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for uh, any discussion, dis discussion points, questions, answers, and the such. Uh, so without further ado, I wish to move to invite the authors uh, to uh, come forward. The very first, I'll uh, ask uh, Tom Griffin. Uh, he's a freelance writer and researcher and a doctoral candidate at the University of Bath. He's a former executive editor and political correspondent of the Irish World, and he also writes and researches for um, Spinwatch. So without further ado, please come. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the question of who the hell was Henry Jackson and why would you want to name a society after him in the first place, which was um, the question a lot of British journalists asked when the, when the uh, society was originally um, founded. Um, Henry Jackson was uh, a long-serving US senator from about the 19... He was in national politics from the 1940s to the 1980s, um, and he ran as for presidential election twice. And... Um, what we were told when we talk, spoke to people who had been involved in the early years of the Henry Jackson Society was that he was seen as a bipartisan figure, somebody who, who could appeal to liberals, uh, liberal interventionists in the Labour Party as, as well as Conservatives. So we sort of tried to look back at his record and see how much evidence there was for, for this. And we did find he, at some occasional left-wing positions that he took up. Um, for example, um, we talked to the Irish National Caucus in, in the US who, um, who had a statement of support from him in, in the 70s supporting IRA hunger strikers, which, which we thought was particularly interesting given that um, people like David Trimble are our strong supporters of the Henry Jackson Society. Um, now, obviously, if you agree with that position, then it doesn't really require further explanation. But um, for sort of right-thinking Englishmen like myself m might wonder whether he was perhaps, as a, as a presidential candidate, trying to curry favour with a particular constituency and on the East Coast in the US. And I think if you ask that question, then you have to ask um, also, um, does that apply to his support for Israel as well? Which, which um, also came about about the time he became a uh, presidential candidate. There's not a lot of, of um, evidence in his career from the 1940s even up to the 1967 war of um, support for, for Israel. What he was really consistent in was being a basically a militarist, a strong supporter of the <coughs> defense budget in the, in, the early, in the early part of his career in the 1940s, he, um, he was a strong supporter of internment of, Jap internment of Japanese Americans. In the 1950s, he, was, he served on committees with Senator Joe McCarthy and didn't really challenge him at all until, until uh, McCarthy's own fall. So what we found basically was that his, his support for Israel became part of his platform really in the, in the 1970s. And some people would explain that as being part of his presidential bid. I think there is a sort of more principled explanation, which was that around the time of the 1973 Middle East War, support for Israel became really closely aligned with support for the West in the Cold War and opposition to detente with the Soviet Union, because there was a real fear amongst supporters of Israel that if there was detente between the US and the Soviet Union, um, two superpowers collectively would oppose a, a peace settlement in the Middle East. And that's really Henry Jackson's significance for history. He was the leader of the coalition in Congress against detente, which brought together supporters of Israel, uh, the, 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 def the defense industry in the US, um, together to oppose detente. And that really is Henry Jackson's legacy to, um, to the Henry Jackson Society. Is uh, that militarist coalition um, and people who would later become founding functions <coughs> of, of the uh, Henry Jackson Society, like Richard Pearl, were really Henry Jackson supporters in the 1970s. Richard Pearl was his sort of assistant, mm -hmm. congressional assistant. So um, on that's my sort of conclusion about Henry Jackson's um, significance for history. Um, and for the Henry Jackson Society today is the legacy of that militarist coalition. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I could
couldn't have uh, thought of a, a better opening to this uh, particular event, the, uh, you know, discussing the name itself. And here I'm looking at the names, I and mean, it's a who, who, who do of uh, warmongering around the world. But um, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, and I, I think that the authors uh, and their couple of years of research into this particular issue will allow them to speak uh, more eloquently on this. Um, uh, Vanessa, I'll, I'm going to ask uh, Hilary Akin. Is a, uh, she's a freelance researcher and writer and a doctoral candidate at the University of Bath. She is a former editor of London Student, the student newspaper of the University of London. Um, could you pass on the uh, microphone? Thank you. Um, so I want to skip forward a few years. Um, in the report, we document the development, uh, the, found, the founding of the society at uh, Peterhouse College, Cambridge, uh, the move to London. And I'll talk a little bit about <coughs> their activities and what the Henry Jackson Society has actually been doing uh, for the last uh, five or six years. Um, on the one hand, I'll look at, look at the APPGs, the all-party parliamentary groups, and their influence they've had in Parliament. And on the other hand... Um, a group called Student Rights, which was, um, which is uh, its campus uh, monitoring arm, and what they, what the influence they had on, on campuses in the UK. So, um, from about 2009, the Henry Jackson Society managed to um, found uh, two APPGs. Now, APPGs are, are sort of notorious as a channel for backdoor influence in Parliament. Um, the financial uh, transparency regulations have been slightly tightened up in the last few years, but there's still, as I'll explain, um, uh, lots of donors, lots of arms companies, lots of corporate influence, and um, any charity or think tank such as the Henry Jackson Society can provide the secretariat. Um, they founded uh, two in about 2009, one on transatlantic and international security, and the other on homeland security. They got 20 MPs together. There's a diagram in the book, it shows you they're mostly Tory MPs, there you go. Um, however, um, you know, some neoconservative uh, Labour's, in particular there, Gisela Stewart, in the middle. And the kinds of uh, events that they organised with these APPGs um, were bringing a lot of um, US neoconservatives, um, defence and security ex uh, personnel from around the world, um, people who were uh, people who were instrumental in uh, the founding of Guantanamo Bay, um, uh, particularly, for, yeah, so Republicans. Um, more recently, actually, uh, in January this year, they brought uh, someone called Bobby Jindal, who's the Republican governor of Louisiana, I believe, and he was given a platform in the House of Commons to speak, and that's where he made his notorious comments about there being no-go zones um, where only Muslims could go in the UK. So this is the kind of influence that they were bringing into Parliament. Now we did have some success in pushing it back against their power, making a strategic complaint to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, um, because the, the rules state that anyone providing the Secretariat for an APPG needs to reveal any donors above £5,000, who are donating any, uh, above £5,000. They didn't want to do that, um, for reasons we can all only speculate on. And so they did discontinue those APPGs, or they stepped down from the Secretariat and now they've been Discontinued. However, unfortunately, I think this tells us something about the uh, limitations of the kind of rules governing our supposedly financially transparent democratic institutions. They're still organising events in Parliament. They simply got some uh, some peers to give the parliamentary passes, so they've still got an influence there. Um, on the other side, I just want to mention student rights. There's a small section in the report about about that group. Now, they also popped up mid 2009. There was nothing to indicate at that time that they were a front for the Henry Jackson Society. Um, I sort of wrote an article for a student newspaper back then when we found out that's who they were. But they have had uh, a remarkable success in getting uh, media attention. They were the group who was behind the uh, furore, quite manufactured furore, around um, gender segregation on campus um, last year. And as, as Ibrahim and lots of other people, I think uh, some other people here in the audience have can speak about, they really uh, basically had a, 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 an agenda that was about persecuting Muslim students on, on, on British campuses. There's nothing that you know, they could do right. So when FOSIS, the Federation of Student Islamic Societies, um, would raise a lot of money, incredible amounts of money for charity, student rights would have an article in the media saying, 
they've given some of this money to a group who are linked to this person who once said that, and we think, you know, it, it's sort of this kind of, you, you can't win, everything was, uh, was linked to extremism. Anyway, again, you know, w we had some influence uh, pushing back on this group's student rights, exposing the fact that they were a front for the Henry Jackson Society. Lots of student unions around the country passed motions uh, against them, saying who this group are, uh, that they've got toxic influence, and that they don't represent students. And eventually the National Union of Students passed a motion against them. Um, so we, we feel that was a success, and now they usually get named as a part of the Henry Jackson Society in the press, which is a small but significant victory. Um, however, again, it again, tells us something about the media today. They don't mind that a group calling itself student rights has been condemned by uh, the National Union of Students representing 7 million members, and they're still willing <coughs> to give it a platform. Um, but I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor David Miller. Uh, he's a professor of sociology in the Department of Social and Policy Sciences at the University of Bath. He is an RCUK, I believe, a Royal College UK um, Research Council UK Global Uncertainty Leadership Fellow, 2013 to 2015, conducting a project to examine the construction, use, and impact of expertise on terrorism. He has written widely on propaganda, spin, and lobbying, and was co-founder of Public Interest Investigations, a non-profit company of which Spinwash and Powerbase are projects. Recent publications include A Century of Spin, how public relations became the cutting edge of corporate power, new liberal Scotland, critical terrorism studies since 11th of September 2001, what has been learned, and researching <coughs> the powerful. Please welcome Professor David Miller. Hi, uh, microphone. Yes. <coughs> Hi. Um, so. I want to talk to you just a little bit about the, the conditions of existence of the Henry Jackson Society, what, what we think is important to do when we look at organisations like think tanks or lobby groups, is to examine how, how it is that they're able to uh, do the things that they do. So the ideas are important, the, the thinking in the think tank, but also the, the, the how they come to be, how, what, is, what are the means by which they're able to support themselves and conduct their activities. So we want to suggest, or at least I want to suggest that, that, that one needs to uh, to, take, to understand Islamophobia, it seems to me, one has to understand what are the conditions of existence of Islamophobic, uh, Islamophobic ideas. It's not just the ideas, as people were saying earlier, it's the, it's the whole, <laughs> the matrix, was there. <laughs> it's the matrix which underlies that, and it, that has specific conditions of existence. And in this case, that has specific conditions of existence, it, which includes financial means. And you can see that the, uh, the graph here of the total income um, from 2006 until 2010, relatively modest, up to 300,000 pounds a year. And then you can see the huge increase uh, of uh, three times to four times as much uh, after 2009. And of course, what happened in 2009 was that the Centre for Social Cohesion, which we did a, the last report on, which Anna's just talking about, uh, merged into the Henry Jackson Society, <coughs> uh, along with its director, the uh, extremely, extremely estimable Douglas Murray. Do you want to go back to the slides for that? <laughs> You're a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well known Islamophobia, you know, the person who said that uh, conditions for Muslims across Europe must be made harder across the board and all that stuff. Uh, he's always on that Sunday morning religious show, you've seen that. Yeah. that. He's always in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> so M Murray joins, C CSC joins, and immediately, um, back to the slide with the money, the, the, the finances of it go, go, right, go right up. And that, and that what we see in that, in that period, in that transformation, where, we, where what we see in the report is that it's the period after Mendoza's coup, that uh, Alan Mendoza fits the organizes a grip on the society, Murray comes in, that this, move, this moves the Henry Jackson Society from having kind of liberal interventionist and left supporters or, or rhetoric much more in the direction of, Islam, of extreme and, uh, and clear Islamophobia. And that, that's partly because it's got the sense of social cohesion in it, in, but also, as you can see here, the uh, uh, the funding regimes have changed. The funding regimes changed. The CSC brought in some of their fundings, funding uh, agencies, and you can see that the main funders here are these um, that we managed to uncover. We can't get all the funders because it's secret. We can only get funders from the Child Commission documents uh, of particular foundations which disclose which foundations they give to. Not all of them do. The ones we found um, up to £350,000 of funding in 2013 um, include the RIPLAT, Iranda, CAMS, 
Lewis and Atkin foundations. Now, in particular, to talk about uh, um, Atkin and uh, Cav, the Atkin family uh, used to uh, own the event David Bottle Company, which is still the story of the dollar in pounds in 2003 or four, and they've put a lot of money into the Henry Jackson Society, as well as into uh, terrorism research, the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College, which we were talking about yesterday. Also, get a bit, got about a million pounds from that from uh, a key uh, uh, Zionist funder. Uh, and uh, should we go back? Sorry. And the second thing is to, is to note Lord Cairns, uh, Stanley Cairns, the, the Lord President of USG International, formerly known as Dixon, the former Treasurer of the Conservative Party, uh, who's been behind uh, these organisations. Good. Back. <laughs> Sorry. So, Cairns and Atkin, two key funders, uh, and uh, in, in particular, uh, they're funds which have pushed the CFC, um, HPS in, in a more Islamophobic like direction. Um, and if you go to the next thing, and you can see that the, these organisations, these the foundations we've looked at, Lewis, Rick Black, Men's Widow, the CAMS, Iranda, Phillips and Rubin, they also, and Atkin, they also fund a number of other organisations. They fund some charitable works, which we offer and the like, uh, but they also fund other political organisations. These are three of the biggest other organisations that they fund, uh, political organisations they fund. So the Henry Jackson Society there in red, this, the Community Security Trust, uh, 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 Jewish Common Defence Organisation, which uh, that, which doesn't say it's a, a Zionist, or it says it's not a Zionist organisation. Nevertheless, they've got to get themselves itself involved in, in uh, pro-Israel activities and in defining uh, anti-Semitism in such a way that it catches uh, pro-Palestinian human rights activities, as you might expect. Uh, the EGIA, uh, one of the key, uh, is the UK branch of one of the key Israeli national institutions, along with the UNF and the Jewish Agency, and the Jerusalem Foundation, uh, an organisation engaged in settlement activity in East Jerusalem. So you can see the kind of, uh, of other funders, of uh, uh, agencies that these foundations fund, and you can see the kind of network uh, and uh, ideas, uh, in a way, uh, underpinning uh, some of the people who fund the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, and so that, that I'll, I'll conclude by saying that, you know, that we, what we, we see here is, is that, that a, a push, we go back to Lord Cairns, a push from the funders towards a much more Islamophobic position, and in particular to Lord Cairns, Sorry, and th th this, is a, this is a quote from uh, uh, Tony Lerman's fantastic memoir, uh, The Making and Unmaking of Zionists, uh, where he talks about working with these Jew Jewish policy researchers who wanted to do evidence-based work on anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic attack, uh, and was, were opposed by the funders, including Lord Cairns, who in the mid-2000s said that what the IJPR should be doing is fighting Islam, showing complete support for the two people who stood up for Islam, Tony Blair, and George Bush. Most Muslims didn't want to integrate. Ultimately, they would line up behind the fundamentalists. A tremendous chap. <laughs> now, now, what we see, this very, very last thing to say, is what we see there is that these are, there's a collection of funders which have a, a, an ultra-conservative position. They're, they're usually conservative Zionists, but they're also in, in, embedded in the mainstream of the conservative movement in this country. So Carnes was the, 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 the uh, chair, the treasurer of the Conservative Party. He flirted a little bit with uh, UKIP in the mid-2000s, um, but he, he, may, you know, he remains a key actor. The other funders are all key actors in the conservative movement in this country, and they also mostly have a, 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 key, a key Zionist funding bent as well. And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, last but not least, in terms of uh, the authors of the report, Dr. Sarah uh, Marusek is a freelance researcher and writer. She has a PhD in social sciences from the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. Her doctoral research focused on Islamic activism in Lebanon and was funded by the generous support of the Mellon Foundation. She has an MA from the Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School in New York City, an undergraduate degree in Literature and Art History from Goldsmiths University of London. Prior to graduate studies, Sarah worked in the Arts and Publishing in London and New York. Sarah, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be... I'll be very brief because I know that time is short. I'm basically just going to address the international dimension of the Henry Jackson Society. And going back to the founding signatories, what we see with the international captains, there are two things that they share. They're mostly American, and they were all really ardent supporters or even architects of the war against Iraq and the occupation of Iraq. So I think that's really significant to see um, right from the very start, even though there was diversity inside the UK the American support was incredibly right-wing neoconservative. I should just go to the last slide. Um, and more recently, especially since the merger with Henry Jackson, um, with the Center for Social Cohesion, uh, the Henry Jackson Society has become more and more interested in its operations in America. 
Um, this happens on two levels. It's political, but it's also financial. It was really difficult um, looking at the financial network, not only in the UK, but also in the US, because not all of the, um, not all of the, 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 the sources of funding are necessarily charitable foundations. In the United States, we could determine which charitable foundations um, donated to Henry Jackson Society by looking at their IRS files, but there are a lot of donors who actually don't have charities, and so they just give, um, and we have no idea who they are. Um, but on the political level, um, both Alan Mendoza and Douglas Murray have spoken at several national conferences organized by APAC. Um, Murray, is probably where he met Bobby Jindal, spoke in uh, Louisiana in 2012 as well at an APAC conference. Um, in the following year, the society funded uh, Priti, Pat Priti Patel's trip to Washington to participate in, quote, the APAC Homeland Security Forum. Um, and then the following year, in 2014, they sent Jonathan de Jangli, um, probably mangling his name, but to Washington to participate in another APAC conference known as the APAC US Europe Israel National Security Forum. Um, and uh, Samar Libde, who actually worked with the Henry Jackson Society at one point, um, even tweeted in November 2014 that the society is now the UK proxy for APAC. Um, the, the Henry Jackson Society also started to reach out to the United States for funding. Um, in 2001, they created a US uh, Friends of Organization, American Friends of the Henry Jackson Society, and it was uh, based in Virginia, but it went through the Charity Aid, Charities Aid Foundation of America. And again, this was really difficult to find any information about. It's very, very non-transparent. But we did find some of the donors, and one in particular that was of interest was the Abstraction Fund, which donated $10,000 in 2011. And th for those of you who don't know, the Abstraction Fund is headed by Nisa Ro Nina Rosenwald, um, who also finances the right-wing Gatestone Institute, um, and was a former member of the National Board of APAC. Um, she's been widely uh, attributed to funding the anti-Muslim uh, anti network, basically, um, in the United States. She also funds what I think we were speaking at a few people earlier, the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Um, so you see that these really extreme right-wing sources uh, of American um, Islamophobic uh, neoconservative groups are starting to reach out to the Henry Jackson Society. Um, the society actually expanded its operations in 2012. Again, like I said, we really couldn't find any information about the American Friends of Organization, but they did launch the following year, um, Henry J Jackson Society, Inc., which basically does the same thing. It allows American taxpayers to give money to the Henry Jackson Society that is tax deductible. So basically all Americans are subsidizing this funding to the Henry Jackson Society. And its founding chief executive, Ilana Decker, was previously a director of APAC for the Northeastern United States. Um, and the current trustees, actually, the only two people among them who are, were involved in the original Henry Jackson Society um, are Alan Mendoza and Brendan Sims. Basically, everyone else was pushed out subsequently. Um, and the last person I want to mention is this man here. Um, he's one of those funders that we don't really know that much about. His name is Leonard Blavatnik. He made his money in Russia. Um, oligarch, it's actually very questionable how he made his money. He rose to fortune very quickly um, and is described as a criminal. And he's had many, uh, many different, uh, many different difficulties, um, but always uh, seems to always be able to evade them. I just read yesterday that one of his companies actually went bankrupt. Um, he seems to have endless, endless money. He bought Time Warner Music. Um, and he also gave 20 million to Tel Aviv University in 2014, sponsors scholarships for soldiers in the Israeli Defense Forces, and also um, funds different other pro-Israel um, causes, not only in the UK, but also in the US. He actually lives in New York, but we don't know any financial information about him. So he's kind of symbolic of sort of like, we, you know, we know some of the people who fund Henry J Jackson Society, but they're really non-transparent. Um, the way they acquired their fortunes is uh, sometimes questionable. Um, and, but it's this international reach now that um, you see Douglas Murray here standing with Robert Spencer, who was also spoken about earlier. This international reach where the Henry Jackson Society really is more of a transatlantic um, organization than just a UK-based think tank. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's amazing how, even when we're talking about something like this, um, America is so fascinating, we're so bland. I mean, we, we don't even have an oligarch. 
feel in Britain to fund the Henry Jackson Society. I mean, it's so incredibly interesting and uh, almost Hollywood-like. But, but thank you, thank you, Sarah. It's, uh, uh, and, and, and those were the authors of the report. And the way that we wanted to do today was to add to the inside perspective, because uh, our four authors have been involved with this project for a couple of years now, it was also important for people from outside that team um, who had seen the report, read about it, who had um, some background knowledge about certain facets of, of the issue, uh, to also shed some light on uh, this particular issue. So um, I will uh, introduce first uh, Moazam Beg, who's well known to all of you. Uh, Moazam is uh, a former Guantanamo Bay detainee. He's the uh, uh, outreach director at CAGE. Um, uh, and the most notably, Muazzam has, as we all know, has been tried um, on several occasions uh, for, uh, for, for charges of, of terrorism, and um, every single time he has uh, been cleared. And uh, the last occasion that we, most of us here got involved with in the campaign to, uh, to release Muazzam, but still he spent seven months of his life and his family's life in detention, but then the case was dropped. So, without further ado, Mazen Bey. Thank you, Enes, um, for that glowing introduction. Um, yeah, unlike most of you, I'm not a, uh, an academic by any means. Um, I'm just a full-time terrorism suspect. <laughs> Um, I have to also de declare an interest. Um, I'm also from that region in Birmingham where uh, it's been declared to be a no-go uh, no zone. Uh, it used to be called Halal Green, but after Fox News facts, it was changed to Hall Green. Uh, one of the things that I found that was uh, particularly important uh, in this report was the inclusion of uh, William Shawcross and his work with the Charities Commission and his relationship to the Henry Jackson Society. And this is particularly important for us as an organization, CAGE, because we've been targeted um, by my beautiful colleague, Arsene, uh, for uh, essentially calling the security services to account. And so CAGE was attacked uh, right across the board for declaring or to let the world know that the man known as Muhammad Amwazi, who may have been Jihadi John, was in fact uh, pursued and harassed by the security services to the point that he felt suicidal, to the point that he felt that he was um, going, wanted to commit suicide and he wrote in, as such to say, several journalists. Um, as a result of the furore that followed from that, uh, CAGE was put under an immense pressure and the charities that supported CAGE, because CAGE is not a, a charity, um, had to pull out any funding and that uh, um, essentially had been pushed through the Charities Commission. Now the power that's been given to the Charities Commission uh, is unprecedented. But more importantly, the connection of people like William Shawcross, who has been part of that driving machine who very clearly in his previous statements um, has said that he believes, and he talks about Muslims here, that the West is threatened by a vast fifth column, that there are thousands of European-born people in Britain, in France, in Holland, in Denmark, and everywhere who wish to destroy us. This is the man who is now in charge of the Charities Commission, which has been given unprecedented powers and are investigating over 55 different Muslim charities. In our case, they weren't investigating Muslim charities, they were investigating uh, non-Muslim charities that were assisting a group that was calling for accountability and had been doing so and had been targeted since. And essentially, one of the things that we've been doing right from the beginning, the reason why I ever got involved with CAGE was this, that when I returned from Guantanamo, I found very quickly and very clearly that there were certain people who were prepared to go the extra mile to simply ask the government, we understand what the Americans have been doing, but what have you been doing? 
What was your involvement? What was the security services involvement in torture and abuse? Why was, for example, Shakar Ahmad, uh, the man who's been held in Guantanamo for 13 years, never been um, charged with a crime, not even by the low standards of the military commission's process, <coughs> which, by the way, it's really important to recognize that William Shawcross, who's the head of the Charities Commission, believes that Guantanamo and the military commission's process there is a good thing and is on record of having said that it's actually better than Nuremberg. And so, while we've been asking for this accountability and uncovering over the years the layers of involvement of British security services involved in the rendition of people like myself, Shakar Armour, Abdul Hakim bin Hajj to the Libyan regime and others even in fact an intelligence cooperation between the British government and the Assad regime. And I don't, I don't mean uh, um, Hafez al-Assad, I mean Bashar al-Assad and in the regimes in fact of Egypt. That this intelligence cooperation has gone to the core of uh, what's so insidious in this war on terror and the reason why we're targeted I have absolutely no doubt about this at all, as somebody who's been um, under the magnifying glass constantly for the past 13 to 14 years, is that those in power do not like to be held to account. They don't like their dirty laundry to be uh, um, brought to the public for, and that is because um, they have been in it, complicit in torture, complicit in rendition, mm -hmm. complicit in false imprisonment, complicit or mm -hmm. directly involved in the, in the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. And they don't expect and they don't like an uppity Muslim organization or Mus an organization that is populated with Muslims to say, we know that you keep frightening us and telling us that you're watching us. <coughs> what you don't like is that we say to you that we're watching you right back. And um, one minute. One minute. Yeah. So this is essentially what I think um, we've been faced with. We had a, a case against the British government, the former Guantanamo prisoners, um, for a civil action many years ago. And it had to be stopped because the government had pumped in tens of millions of pounds. And we got a settlement, but the settlement uh, was on the basis that uh, if we didn't take it, the legal aid would have been stopped. The Justice and Security Act uh, bill that was uh, being pushed would have been passed and such cases in future would have been heard in secret. But my point about this is that this, what I've, the, the, the theme that I've seen in the report, if there's anything that, that I take away, it's that there is an endless amount of money being pushed in to the Henry Jackson Society and the organizations like it. Um, for example, the offices of the Henry Jackson Society now are in Millbank. That's a place where even the United Nations and the Labour Party found the rent too expensive. <laughs> um, and so w what we can see here is that what they have is money and what they have is people in power. What we have is truth and accountability and that's what we need to continue to push. Thank you very much. Very much. Um, and next, I'd like to invite uh, Victoria Britton, um, who's the former associate foreign editor at uh, The Guardian, um, and she's an author. Um, she has written Hidden Lives, Hidden Deaths, and Death and Dignity. But b before Victoria comes to the podium, I, I really need to say that uh, uh, the likes of Muazzam and uh, Shakir Amir and uh, many, many others who fell foul of um, false terrorism charges, some of whom were acquitted and uh, the cases dropped, <coughs> some of whom still await that, that particular announcement and, uh, and, and stand. Um, one thing that the, the British public, ourselves included, uh, were never told about were the plight of the families. Uh, those people who were taken away for months on end, um, left behind uh, spouses, parents, children, who were rid of many, many of the luxuries that you and I take for granted and never think a second about, um, about not having. Um, and the person who constantly was there for those families in the absence of the accused uh, was Victoria. It's, a, it's an incredible pleasure to be um, associated with Victoria. Her work has been absolutely fantastic and it gives me great pleasure to uh, invite her to say a few words.
Thank you for your kind words, Anna. Um, and thank you, uh, David, for inviting me. Um, I hardly know where to start because this is such an incredibly um, rich report. But I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make really four points. One is about the research. The second is about what it tells us about our democracy. And the third is about charities. And the fourth is on Henry Jackson Society structures. Now, many of these have been touched on by, by others. Um, but I think I just want to start by saying that this, this linking of kind of old Cold War mentalities with a general devotion to militarism at a moment like this, when the Americans are putting more troops into Iraq, which they've already um, totally destroyed. Our people are also in there um, covertly. Um, and you all know what is the situation in Gaza and the occupied territories. So it's within that context um, that we're looking at <coughs> Islamophobia here and the links between all these things are, are very importantly um, outlined in, in this report. But I want to start with two quotes from it um, which indicate why I'm afraid I am completely guilty of not having taken the Henry Jackson Society um, seriously. Uh, one is from... Uh, the much discussed uh, Douglas Murray, who said after the Charlie Hebdo events that this was a bloody attempt to impose Islamic blasphemy law around Europe. Now, who could begin to take such a person seriously? Obviously, I'm not. Uh, and the second, um, one of the many fascinating <coughs> nuggets within this report, was a quote from a Labour MP, Gazella Stewart, who's one of the trustees of the Henry Jackson Society, when she was talking about the possibility that uh, John Kerry uh, might have uh, won the presidential election in, um, in America, she said, this would herald a surge in terrorism and suicide bombing. Um, so with those kind of um, bits of background, uh, as I say, I wasn't taking it, um, I wasn't really taking it seriously. But I want to start with my first point on the research. And I think you've got some idea of how painstaking this research has been, particularly on the uh, economic side that, uh, that David spoke about, but also all the links between these, these different people. And I think the, the, the quality of this research is so important, and it gives us a, a new picture of our society. Um, and I want to that links to, when I finished reading it for the first time, I felt I'm living in a different country. What does this tell me about democracy in, in our country? And I can't wait for the uh, unveiling of the report in the House of Commons. Hope there'll be plenty of red faces as you give your very good presentation about it. Um, because it's actually completely devastating when it sh in the way that it shows you how decisions are made and how influences are uh, networked with, with, within our, our society. Um, you know, I think it seems so old-fashioned to think that London clubs and Cambridge colleges are a kind of like the fulcrum of a web of influence that spreads, as you've already heard, around the United States in this very influential way. I know we have a government which is run by um, what seems to me like boys from Eton, um, and we're used to the fact that it doesn't represent us, but that the, the extent to which our MPs, and I've already mentioned one Labour MP, there are plenty of others in a very shaming position of being part of, uh, of Henry Jackson. Um, so those are those two points that I want to make, but I, I also hope that because of the, the way in which you disseminate it um, is going to be incredibly important. And despite the meticulous, painstaking research, it's actually a page-turner. When I, I finished it the first time, I just started again. 
because it's absolutely riveting. And I commend whoever was the, the kind of lead writer because it's really wonderfully written. Um, so now I want to just make a few points about uh, charities in general, which Mozem has, has, uh, has, has talked about. Um, and what you find within here is it's not just the uh, William Shawcross um, outrage. <coughs> Um, and as Mozem alluded to the power that um, the Charities Commission now has. And Cameron just gave them another eight million pounds with the actual brute <coughs> of rooting out extremism. What, what has that got to do with what charities have always been in our society? But there it is, that is the world we're, we're, we're living in. Um, and the, I, I then want to move on to the last bit, which is to just talk a little bit about the Henry Jackson Society's structures and some of its uh, spin-offs, and some fairly unfortunate ones. Um, the student one has already been mentioned. Uh, there was also a very um, uh, unsuccessful uh, little thing called Just Journalism, which aimed to attack The Guardian mainly and other things for um, doing anything against um, Israel. Um, then there's been um, they've set up something called the Friends of Israel, um, and then uh, there's a, another one which is um, to boost uh, uh, Western capitalism and make sure it has a very free um, uh, atmosphere in which to not be controlled by anything. So you can see the tentacles of the, of this thing, and I I, I can't even begin. But I do urge you all to actually read it. It may look like just another report, but it's actually 85 pages of great, great reading. Um, one of you mentioned, yes, Hillary mentioned um, the uh, APPGs. And um, again, you know, you, you, you can hardly believe that this group of people could have had that much power within Parliament and that enough Labour MPs could have been dumb enough to want to be part of it. And the ki some of the kind of things that, they, that she, she mentioned, they do various talks and things. But I'm sure some of you are, um, are, are familiar with the um, son of the um, Hamas leader called um, Mosab Hassan Yusuf. Um, who, who was captured by the Israelis and he then became an overnight Israeli and converted to Christianity and he now does propaganda for Israel. Um, and he gave a talk, he was invited here, um, and he gave a talk in the synagogue in, in Golders Green in which he denounced Islam. And the leaders of the synagogue apologized afterwards <coughs> for, and said that his views did not represent theirs. Nonetheless, the Henry Jackson Society has him in Parliament. And it's, it's the absolute audaciousness of their propaganda attitudes um, that I think is, is really scary. Mirza mentioned the word accountability. And it's that they, they think that within this society, they can do whatever they like. And the truth is, they can't. And the reason that they can't is because of the mass mobilizations we've managed to have well, unsuccessfully, but we still have mass mobilizations, and because of work like this, which I think gives us the information to be much, much more active on many fronts. So I strongly um, applaud you all for having done it in such a brilliant way, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. We have just under 10 minutes to go, so we'll set, try to take um, uh, questions. Be very, very brief. If you have a statement to make, try to make it as brief as possible. If it's to a particular panelist, uh, mention who it is to. Otherwise, I'm going to spread around the question. So anyone who wants to say anything, can I see a show of hands? I have one here. Uh, so let's, let's, let's kick off. Mohammed, please. Yes. Hi. Um, why do you think... Um, the we, uh, particularly those of us who have been targeted by the Henry Jackson Society, why do you think we've been so slow to respond and organise ourselves uh, coming up with, with exposing them for, for what they are and who they are? 
Very interesting. Um, uh, he didn't introduce himself, I'll introduce him. A very good friend, Mohan Saab, who's uh, extremely prolific on Twitter and Facebook, I'm pretty sure. And he's been on the Nicky Campbell uh, Sunday morning uh, religious show alongside Douglas Murray, may I add? Before we and, uh, <laughs> and, and also he was in discussion with Tommy Robinson, is that correct? Uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, uh, a good question. Why is it you think that we have joined this particular bandwagon, if you wish, so lately? What kept us all this time? I think that the answer is quite straightforward. I mean, it's to do with how we understand the and how we, we don't tend to pay enough attention to the elite social movements that push forward the Balaburi. We focus on the EDL and the far right and the DNP and, and the left fight for one street and does that, does that, that work and that must continue, but we don't tend to look at the elite social movements that help to drag the state right in some respects into the fifties. If we do focus on Tibet, everyone knows about Tibet and campaigns of left right. But if you see people in the middle, the Zionist, the neo conservative movement, the pro war left, these are the people who are are providing the ideas which allows Islamophobia to continue and progress and develop itself. But we, we forget to look at them. We think, and, and that's partly because they're too conservative, partly because uh, they don't get so much attention. They're a state think tank, they work in the background. But they are incredibly <coughs> important as part of that whole matrix. That's it. Very good. Um, thank you. Can I just say something here as, you know, from our work as uh, the Cordura Foundation, because we have done quite extensive work on Islamophobia, particularly within the political and media. Uh, spectrums, and I, I, I think that in addition to what David has just said, I think that there is a, a gross misunderstanding of the term Islamophobia. Whilst it essentially talks about uh, racism that is directed against Muslims, and by the way, it could claim victims who are non-Muslims. In fact, when we talk about Islam uh, Islamophobia, I mentioned this in, in a panel that I and David were at during the weekend, and I said, arguably, the very first victim of Islamophobia post 9/11 was actually a Sikh taxi driver in Bradford. So whilst it's, it's quite simple for in, in, those, in those particular terms, but the term Islamophobia has been loaded politically as well as ideologically and turned against what it actually means. And therefore, those who are using the term um, are using it not in order to serve the cause of eradicating a form of racism that we are in the midst of, but for political gains. And, and um, I, I, I still recall a few years ago, if you remember that, that, that horrid Dutch uh, politician Gerd Wilders, who was allowed the second time round uh, into London, and he had a press conference in Westminster Abbey. And I recall that vividly. Um, when he was talking in his usual, um, very colorful language on race, and, and everyone around him, the, the, the journalists, the, the media correspondents, were onto him. They were onto him. They were giving him a really, really hard time. Once he mentioned Islam, Islamic culture, everyone took a step back, everyone quiet. It's as though we don't understand it. We're not comfortable with the term <coughs> Islamophobia. So that's just um, you know one other thing that might be added to. Okay, I have two hands: the gentleman here and the gentleman here. Yes. I don't honestly see the reports as I'm true, but one thing that's very obvious to me as the old Cold War and the War on Terror is the influence of Nobel. Mm. So many of the people in here are time prisoners, <coughs> and that whole network has been extremely. Finkelstein is one. Finkelstein helped set up the Social Democratic Party in Britain before he moved his way into the Tory Party. That's a critical influence in all of this. I think we've been interested in the phone hacking, but the more serious dimension, I think infinitely more serious, is the way Murdoch has been part of this pro Israel, pro Cold War now, pro war on terror thing. It's very serious. The guy who edited the Observer during the Iraq War was Lockheed. <coughs> now found a home at Whoppy, at what used to be Whoppy, working for the Times. There's a whole succession of them. Aronovich started on the Independent, <coughs> moved to the Guardian, finished up on the Times, home of Murdoch. And if you follow Murdoch and the various connections of people there, it ties in very closely with a lot of the excellent work that's been done in this report. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, on this particular point, um, <coughs> before the elections, um, I had uh, a meeting with someone who was quite senior within the uh, Labour Party campaign. Um, and one of the things we talked about was Islamophobia. 
um, I was actually, I couldn't say I was shocked, it was expected, but I was sort of stunned by the way that this gentleman put his argument. He said, listen, I agree with everything that you've said. And we spoke for about 20, 25 minutes. I agree with everything that you've said. However, no one can be seen today to go soft on extremism or terrorism. And therefore, although I agree with you entirely, I simply cannot, simply because the media will be on my back. Now, it just shows what you've just said, both of you, regarding the role of the media in shaping the narrative and in opening or closing down the spaces through which we can, we can discuss these issues publicly. Um, yes, I have Mick and I have the gentleman here, yes. Short question, do any of the panel think there might be a vulnerability here to be exploited in the Henry Jackson Society? William Shawcross was put into the Charities Commission to, uh, defend, is, to defend Israel. In, he's already been a member of a pro-Israel advocacy group where he pledged to defend Israel in the institutions of the international, you know, of the international community. Um, the Jewish National Fund is a primary uh, pillar of Israeli apartheid. Tony Blair remains a patron. The interesting thing is, and this is where there might be a vulnerability, David Cameron resigned as a patron of the JNF a couple of years ago, uh, and I think it's because it was possibly too toxic and he was afraid of, of uh, something happening there. Normally, the three party leaders become automatically pretty much patrons of the JNF. Instead of three out of three, they now have zero out of three because Miladine and Clegg declined the invitation. Now, if the Henry Jackson Society and Shawcross are defending the JNF while going for every Islamic and Muslim charity they can, is this a vulnerability that we might be able to explore? Very, very good point. Yes. Um, my question is about um, maybe what they might consider the wider aim and the long term aim of the uh, Henry Jackson Society and the Center for the Hadith, which is what are they trying to achieve in the society? Because, in a way, you know, uh, society itself might go a bit further and further in the individuals who kind of are still there, whereas the kind of the long goal is quite simple. Okay, so I'm going to put it to the panel this question the question about the vulnerability uh, and the question on the media. Um, who wants to go? Victoria, do you want to say anything, particularly on the media side? Um, well, I, I mean, I agree. Of course, they, of course the media is, is tremendously important. And, and all those names you've mentioned, you know, are the people we love to hate. But I actually think that more important is the racist and Islamophobic discourse <coughs> of, the, of the top politicians. If you look back at what Theresa May uh, Cameron, Boris Johnson, and so many others said about Abu Qatada in the years that he was here. And let's all remember, he was completely innocent and he was persecuted here all those years. But the, the, the way they spoke about, about him and the way that they allowed um, that kind of discourse to become normal aided and abetted, I'm afraid, by Yvette Cooper, who was also in there. Um, it's not just the media. It's the top <coughs> of the political class who think it's okay to do that. Fine. Um, Hilary, on the question of vulnerability and the fact that um, the JNF now have no uh, leaders of the, political, the main political parties as, as patrons, do you see that as an area that could be exploited in terms of uh, particularly short crosses and the charity commission stand. Um, as David mentioned, it is all part of the, the power structure. I mean, Shogos was appointed by the uh, by a, 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 a committee of MPs, um, and it's becoming increasingly clear. I think what we need to do is build a body of evidence that displays their double standards. So, uh, Alan Mendoza, the director of the Henry Jackson Society, um, up until the seventh of May, was a conservative candidate. We made two complaints to the Charity Commission saying, you know, your regulations clearly state you, um, that you, uh, a charity cannot be perceived to be lacking in independence. Now, if there's anything clearer, you know, standing as the director, standing as a, uh, a parliamentary candidate with the both, you know, both <coughs> positions on his Twitter feed, nothing happened, of course. 7th of May, he lost, so that's it. Now, that, now it's, that's, it's in the long grass. Um, so I think, you know, at the moment, you know, there's not that vulnerable, but we need to build up these, these e evidence uh, evidence base like that and to, to sort of form a united front to create some change by some change. Thank you. Mind if you want to say something? Can I have a microphone, please? Thank you. Just two things very briefly. Uh, one is that uh, Cage has recently taken legal proceedings against the Charities Commission for 
uh, what we believe is, is overstepping its mark in trying to force uh, charities to determine who they can and who they can't uh, support and fund, that it is outside <coughs> of their limit. So we shall see uh, what comes with that, but it's, uh, it's unprecedented also. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, you made a mention of, of uh, Andrew Gilligan, who's the uh, um, Telegraph reporter, and he managed it, and this, this ex explains how Islamophobia has become widely expected, uh, accepted from across the board. In one article, he managed to do something that none of us could do, and that is to unite the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And the way he did this, though, was by saying that uh, Baroness Warsi, who's the co-chair at the time of, of the um, Conservative Party, uh, the Islamic Human Rights Commission, which is an ir uh, 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 essentially Shia, uh, uh, um, the, run the guys who run it are Iranians or backed by Iran, Iran. Um, there's the Cordoba Foundation, which you're part of, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the uh, Hizb al-Tahrir, who advocate non-involvement in the political process, or MEND, who invo uh, uh, advocate involvement in the political process. He managed to put all of these organizations and groups and individuals, as well as Tabriki Jamaat, which is the, an apolitical missionary organization, and say they are all radicals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I told him that this is something you've managed to do to put us all in the same boat together, and there's only one common factor. We're all Muslims. Very, very good point. Maybe we can try to get it to unite us on Ramadan and Eid. But Sarah, before you, you, uh, you come in, I'd like to ask you about, I mean, it's quite interesting when you mentioned the, the UK-American link. Is there a further link? Because I, we were approached just in the days before today um, from some friends in Australia, in New Zealand, and in South Africa, saying, listen, we also have similar <laughs> outfits who also um, coordinate and liaison across it. Do you think that it's, it's m maybe some, you know, a point of interest to expand the scope of the report rather than merely on, on the, the UK and, uh, and, and America to involve maybe mainland Europe and as well as Australia and South Africa? I think that the Hindu Latin Society's <coughs> connection to Europe um, really deteriorated when they turned to the United States and yeah. they moved away from Europe. But they do have the Friends of Israel initiative, mm -hmm. which was launched by As Asma, um, the former yeah. Spanish. Spanish yeah. Yeah. So Spanish, yeah. they do have those connections there. I, I'm not aware of any other international connections that they do have, but it would be worth looking at similar organizations and to see if there are, you know, where the patterns emerge and where, where there are crossovers. Because there may be key funders, for example, that are financing these kinds of charities or quote unquote charities. Yeah. Um, we didn't actually mention that in our presentation. Henry Jackson Society is also a charity, um, which is quite funny. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would be well worth looking yeah. into, but it's a big project. So. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted yes. to mention yes, something course, about yes. the vulnerability because actually we wrote this report. As you know, it took a really long time. I came in quite late to it, but we actually finished it before the elections. Subsequently, um, Henry Jackson Society has lost a lot of its Lib Dem and Labour support, either through people stepping down or prominently um, Jim Murphy. Uh, the, what is, exactly. Yeah. So at, right now, the, the Henry Jackson Society is vulnerable because its, it's support is mostly conservative. And they really, I don't know how they're going to reach across to get new support groups. Maybe they will, but we could actually work on that. We can put pressure on the Lib Dems, well, yeah. <laughs> there aren't many of them, but the <laughs> Labour Party um, to, to not okay. cooperate. Um, if I can just bring you in, to, uh, just, just before, uh, you want to say something? Yes, you? Right, we need to wind up. So just one thing, I want you to comment on whether you think that these standings down are because HJS has become a liability, is it a political expedience, what is it because of, and also if you can just shed light very, very quickly on what were the main difficulties in gaining information uh, in order to bolster the report? I mean, well, the biggest thing with difficulty is, so the biggest thing with difficulty obviously is finding out who the funders are mm. um, because they were not prepared to disclose that. So we did kind of reverse engineer it. We had done the work on the Centre for Social Cohesion previously, so that gave us some leads in terms of <coughs> finding it on the, the charities. And I think in terms of the vulnerability, and you mentioned at the public meeting about the need to, to challenge liberal Islamophobia as well as far-right Islamophobia. And I think part of the vulnerability of the Henry Jackson Society is that it's sort of troubled from one to the other. And, and that's the, and that's caused a real sort of crisis in, within the society yeah. when, when Mendoza took over and it lost a lot of its original supporters. And I think obviously 
there could be more work done on that in around sort of challenging the involvement of people in Labour and, and Liberal Democrats. But, but uh, unfortunately, obviously, with the result of the election, that if, if the Conservative support yeah. in some ways it needs, needs to be challenged. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to um, wind down because we have overrun time, but just a, a few uh, notes before so. First of all, I'd like to thank um, our head of, of research and publications, Dr. Abdullah Falik, who worked tirelessly along with David and the team in order to see this report come out. So my thanks to him and also to the designers and editors um, and all the volunteers who are with us here today. Um, I, I must... Uh, once again, repeat my thanks and gratitude uh, and appreciation to everyone on the Spinwatch team, um, Tom, Hillary, uh, Hillary uh, Sarah, and of course, David. Um, their work is, is exemplary, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, and, uh, and we will continue to work with them in the future. Um, uh, thank you to Victoria and Muazzam for traveling to be uh, with us today and to also shed light and, and offer us their thoughts and insights on, on the report. Um, may I just announce to you that we will shortly be launching our third toolkit installment. Now, this is going to be quite interesting. It ties in quite nicely with, with what we're doing today. It's going to be titled The Spectre of Fear, the Far Right in the UK. This is a toolkit, and this comes after our first two, working with the media and lobbying and campaigning toolkit. So this is going to be quite a complementary third part um, to this uh, particular group. The, the, the launch date will be announced soon, so check out our, um, our webpage. And for any inquiries, um, uh, write to media at the code of the foundation .com. I thank you all for being here today. I appreciate uh, the fact that David and his team have allowed us uh, the space and the time to uh, launch this, uh, this report. And um, nothing is left for me but to uh, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.